Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So let's go under the hood and uh, you know look deep inside of Zscaler. Before that, it's probably the most popular slide of the show. You know, Safe Harbor. There's some forward-looking st statements that I'm going to make. Want to make sure we're all protected here. But without further ado, you know, this is what it means to run at the zenith of scale. Uh, at any given moment, we're processing millions and millions of transactions. We're securing and enforcing policies and stopping thousands of threats. But none of this matters unless the network is stable, unless the platform is working and everything is 100%. So before going more into scale, I do want to talk about our operational excellence and the tenets of that operational excellence because they're very important. And I'll also refer to them um, you know, throughout the presentation. So first and foremost, simplify operational health. It sounds simple, uh, but it's not. We, we collect about a trillion metrics per day. Those metrics have to be processed, and ultimately what has to happen is a decision made whether a component is healthy or not. And so what we do and spend a lot of effort on is making sure where we measure, how we measure, and give simple binary answers if something is healthy or if something is not working. <laughs> Somebody likes that. Um, the next tenant is practice failure and recovery. Now, the internet gives us lots of opportunity to do this in real life. Um, but we also sit around the table. We do tabletop exercises and you know, think about what is possible, what is probable, and even things that are impossible. And this is part of the reason why you've heard here today us talk about customer-activated disaster recovery, because you know, anything is possible. The next tenant, optimize deployment. Probably one of the most boring things on the platform is deployment. It's like plumbing. Nobody wants to know about it. Nobody wants to think about it. But I'll tell you what, if it breaks, it really stinks. Um, deployment in our world is not just about pushing code. It's actually you know, thousands and thousands of updates, and I'll talk about that a little later. But deployment in our world is also reacting to an emergency, reacting to a new threat, um, that requires deployment, and deployment globally to hundreds of thousands of instances. So that's a more, while it sounds simple and boring, it is a pretty complicated place. The next tenant is individually orchestrated architecture. Again, this sounds pretty simple. You know, we keep the network separate from the infrastructure, separate from the code. But individually orchestrated architecture is really hard to do because it's very easy to add code or add functionality to something. And over time, it becomes this big monolithic beast that you can't you know, change. It's no longer agile. And so we spend a lot of resources on making sure we separate functionality so that things are horizontally scalable and that they're manageable. And then the final one is continuous review and improvement. So just like you don't get angry at your feet for becoming too big for your shoes, a lot of things that we thought were good and perfect two years ago, they're no longer good. There's a lot of processes that, you know, we call them inertia-based processes where people are doing them and nobody knows why. And so we spent quite a bit of time figuring out what those are and getting rid of them, replacing the tools that we have, and continuously optimizing for the future. So keeping this in mind, let's go back to scale. It really helps to compare Zscaler to other global platforms out there. So as an example, you know, on Twitter, there's about half a billion tweets per day. Uh, credit card transactions, there's about 1.1 billion of them. Most of them are probably from my wife. <laughs> and there is about uh, 8.5 billion Google searches. You can look it up. Google actually publishes all this data. Salesforce. There's 14.9 billion transactions per day. And then when you get to Zscaler, this number is always wrong, but there's 240 billion. It's always wrong because probably now it's 241 or 242. Um, you may ask, how? Why does Zscaler have more transactions than Google or whatever? Well, it's because tweets, Salesforce transactions, credit card transactions go through Zscaler. And this is why, you know, the scale. Now, for those of you that like bits and bytes, at any given moment, Zscaler processes about 500 gigabytes of data. 
If you think about what that means, that's about 250 HD movies watched concurrently in one second. 900,000 movies per hour. But Zscaler is not just a pipe. We're not just processing, you know, we're not just having data flow through us. We actually process every bit and every byte that goes through the platform. And, you know, as I mentioned before about deployment, on any given day, there's about 250,000 updates, security updates that go to the system. Now you may ask, where do those come from? And this is its own you know, machine that we maintain. We collect 40 external feeds from various industry security providers. We have a sandbox product where about 250,000 files from our customers end up. Now those files, they're not necessarily bad, but we know for sure that they do not look good. And then there's the AI ML, right, which is basically looking at websites, when they're registered, uh, what they look like. And then the really, you know, I would say dangerous work that uh, security research and Deepin's team does. And effectively, all of that culminates to 250,000 updates per day. Each one of those has to be pushed globally. Each one of those could potentially be problematic. And so we invest a lot, of t a lot of effort, a lot of resources into automation to make sure that these updates you know, get delivered securely, fast, and you know, they don't harm our customers' traffic. Now, going back and looking at what does a day in the life of Zscaler look like? It's 6,000 unique organizations, tens of millions of users that result in about four terabits of traffic at peak per day, and 13 petabytes of scanned files or scanned data. Those transactions, you know, they ultimately, on a daily basis, end up with 13 billion enforcements, but 7 billion blocks. Those blocks could be something that the policy didn't catch. Again, something that came from AI ML, some new threat that we've detected and pushed the file out. So, you know, 13 billion policies enforced, 7 billion blocks, and 266 million threats. This is something that can potentially have been a compromise or force a re-image of the customer's you know, computer. So it's something really dangerous. So in order to do this, in order to do this at scale, we really had to reinvent how things are done. But before I, I, I talk about how we do it, um, you know, it's really important to go back and look at how things used to be done. So of course, everybody has seen this before. You know, before to build your own security stack, you, you took a bunch of appliances, Whichever functionality you needed, you added, and you created this big daisy chain of basically security appliances that you called your security stack. Now, obviously, you know, when you daisy chain things, you're only as fast as your slowest appliance. And that's pretty obvious to anybody, technical or not. What's not very obvious is that your control plane, your logging plane, your data is spread all over the place. And so you lose control of, you know, what you can do and when you do it and where your information is, which is really critical in today's world. And then what did a lot of people do? You know, they took this appliance security stack, they virtualized it, and they put it on top of somebody else's cloud. So instead of simplifying, they've added yet another component. Zscaler, you know, from day one, born and bred in the cloud, we basically built a very robust and, you know, as, as we said, the architect individually orchestrated architecture, separated environment. We have the control plane. This is where policy is written. We have the enforcement plane. This is where customer data transfers and policy is enforced. But by architecture, by design, this enforcement plane does not store log data. Then we have the logging plane. You know, it's tokenized, it's secure, it's very, you cohesive and so customers get to choose where they put their logs they get to basically pull their logs and we can scale this you know from cont continent to continent or to even private infrastructure for some of the more regulated customers so going back one step you know when when people ask me to describe it in a single word what's the difference between zscaler and you know architecture of others you know i just basically tell them like look would you build a power plant using home generators the answer is you could, but you shouldn't. So our North Stars here is it's our code, our infrastructure, 
and our network. And this is very important. We'll come back to our infrastructure and our network and why we chose that path, because it is a critical, you know, critical and fundamental component of what makes Zscaler Zscaler. But going to the code base, the Zscaler code base is basically 15 million lines of code, and that's increasing daily. It's also 850,000 code revisions, each of which have to be deployed. Right? Remember the key tenets of uh, operational excellence? And it's 300 plus patents that have been issued or pending. And we continue to invest and innovate because a lot of things that we have to do in a multi-tenancy world, in a, in a world of our scale, they cannot be done with open source or commercial products. They just don't work. They, they were never designed for this. So now going back to our infrastructure, our network. Um, the hyperscalers have done an amazing job. They built what I think is the eighth wonder of the world. You know, Amazon, Microsoft, um, you know, Google. They've built these clouds that are just amazing pieces of te technological marvel. But they were built for a very specific purpose. The purpose of these clouds was to host content or to host compute. Now let's imagine a use case where you host a firewall or you host a proxy or some, some sort of security appliance in Google, but the end user wants to get to Microsoft. So what happens? Well, you go to Google by going through the front door. Then you go to the compute area where the you know, NGF or whatever appliance is hosted. And uh, that, air, that is backhauled to a tax advantaged or an energy advantaged area. And that's usually fine if it's just the last hop, because then it just goes back. But in this case, we're going to Microsoft. So we go back out Google's front door to Microsoft's front door to Office 365 to Microsoft's front door, back to Google's front door, back to Google, and then so on and so forth uh, for a very long time. Zscaler's platform was specifically designed not to do this. We're a transit cloud. Nobody wants to go to Zscaler. People are trying to get through Zscaler to content. And so wherever you touch Zscaler, we process your transaction right there, and we hand it off to the content provider. With our network, we invest in peering. We peer with all the big content providers. We make sure that we play hot potato right, with the, with the data. We don't want to hold on to it. We don't want to carry it across a backbone. We don't have a backbone. And that is a big difference. That is the big difference between you know, Zscaler and other providers. Now, all of this, we completely understand and acknowledge that we're an extension of your business. And you can't just take our word for it. We also understand that data privacy and risk have become much more critical as more things move out to the internet and everybody needs accountability. And so again, Zscaler, because we own the platform end to end, because we own the code end to end, we can, we can basically get more and more of these compliance frameworks and pass on the controls and the benefits to you. One way to think about it is because we're a multi-tenancy cloud, when we inherit a good control in any one of these uh, compliance bodies, that control is available on the global platform to all the customers. It's not done for a specific customer. And so all of this, you know, we, we will continue to invest. We'll continue to strengthen our operations and bring, out, bring up our accountability. Now, at the end of the day, 100% renewable energy, audited and verified. And I think transparency-wise, you know, I, I look at a lot of uh, cloud services or cloud providers, not just necessarily security, Zscaler, is probably one of the most, if not the most, transparent with the data. Um, this data is available to you in our website. It's available in your portal or through your TAM, but we always publish these metrics. So at the end of the day, what does this culminate into? A global security platform. Um, but what do customers ask for? Really, everybody wants to have global presence but local performance. And this is what we strive to deliver because again, security must be there, but performance and availability is also absolutely critical. Now, as I said earlier, uh, I wanted to show you some real facts and figures and you know, some of our uh, operational ten uh, of, uh, excuse me, excellence tenants. And one of them is practice failure. I think this one is near and dear to everybody's heart. So, Getting into a time machine, I want to go back to you know, when COVID just started. Um, we at Zscaler always plan on multi-tenancy. 
And so we deploy lots and lots of capacity for our customers. And when COVID just started, as, a, as an interesting example, we saw 10x growth in one quarter. 1.2 million clients were installed just in the month of March. Now, taking this COVID example one step further and more into a technology side, what you see here is basically work from home or um, basically shelter in place happening. What does that mean? I think everybody understands shelter in place. But what does it mean technologically? Well, before we go to the technology, you know, before shelter in place, about 90% of the population was working from offices from managed locations. And about 10% obviously was remote. That's the purple and green lines. When COVID hit, a lot of geographies, a lot of locations, they went basically 100% remote. And you can see this data. We publish, we publish this information in real time and historical. But what does that mean from a technology point of view? Well, this is what the tech stack or the protocol stack looked like before COVID. And this is what it looked like 24 hours later. Now, for those of you that have read the news or they're more, more technical, you understand that if something terminates IPsec, it doesn't necessarily mean it can terminate SSL or GRE. And you can look at the news articles and you know, the horror stories of companies asking their employees to ration VPN. You know, if you're in marketing, you come in from 10 to 12. If you're in another department, you know, 12 to 1 is your time. Well, Zscaler, when you get Zscaler, we don't know if you're going to be coming to us from a managed location or from a remote or, or a road warrior. And so we give you the ability to pick either any given day. And so we had the capacity, we had the capability, the planning in place to allow companies to go from remote to managed, back to remote, back to managed, as, as little, you know, this, this happened in China a few weeks ago, right? Shanghai was locked down, a lot, of, a lot of the places. So this is one of the COVID example. And then the last example that I'll show you is um, the London data center outage. There was a big power loss at Zscaler's third largest data center. It was about three and a half to four hours of, of outage. This is our third largest site. About 5,000 customers um, operate there every day. And uh, you know, the event made the news. AWS was affected. A bunch of commodity exchanges were affected. Everybody was very unhappy. Um, the sad part is because of lack of uh, supply chain, uh, lack of optics, lack of people, we do see the internet as a whole for the foreseeable future becoming less and less stable. But this is why we're here. And so what did Zscaler customers see during this? So what you see here is ZDX. This is one of our customers in, in London, and you know, they're, they're looking at Teams. And that big spike over there is basically London data center going offline. And right away, you see that all the transactions resume. So of course, when a data center goes offline, everybody who was there, they get disconnected. What you see here is what happened uh, right after the outage. So you see that green line went from 0 milliseconds to 10 milliseconds. All the traffic in, in, in London basically failed over to Manchester, Amsterdam. And again, with Zscaler, you don't get a data center. You get the whole platform. And so the customers that have configured failover or that were road warriors, they just failed over automatically. And interestingly enough, our third largest data center going online for multiple hours simply resulted in about 10 tickets where people were just asking us what happened to London. So this is the power you know, of operational excellence, the power of Zscaler, the power of planning. You know, closing out our infrastructure, our code, our network, we continue to make these investments. This is our North Star. And you know, we continue to practice the tenets of operational excellence because at the end of the day, we need to deliver a service to our customers and our partners that is absolutely 100% available, stable, and resilient.